Hi, everyone, and thank you for having me today. I'm Jenny Dorsey. I'm a professional chef, author, and the founder of a social justice nonprofit called Studio Atap. Today, I will be talking about how the politics of food are all around us, quietly influencing our worldviews and shaping the trajectory of our lives. Our relationship with food has never been one based on passive consumption. Food continues to actively drive changes in human behavior and shape our society as we know it. Because our relationship with food fundamentally informs who we believe ourselves to be and how we should act in relation to other people. How? Number one, food has long been a weapon to create in versus out groups. Some of the most avid laws created by colonizers in the Americas were what white settlers could or could not eat. In this way, food became an extension of identity and morality. For example, it was believed that eating indigenous foods would cause Spanish men to lose their beards and thus their masculinity and social standing. To assert dominance and rationalize colonial rule, indigenous diets, which were primarily plant-based, including ingredients like nopales, like you can see here, were forcibly replaced with European diets high in meat, wheat, and sugar. This remains the global norm today, a reminder for all of us that colonialism lives on through our everyday actions. This use of food to ostracize groups of people is not some relic of the past. Consider the bat soup video that went viral at the start of COVID-19. Even if it were later debunked, its implicit messaging about the Asian diet, and thus Asian people, created a narrative of danger and unwanted foreign influence at the height of pandemic fears. And the results speak for themselves. In 2021, hate crimes against Asian Americans rose by 342%. Two, controlling the food supply is the ultimate mechanism for controlling people because food is a direct through line to power. In the Great Plains, white settlers were actively encouraged to exterminate buffaloes to starve indigenous peoples of their ancestral food supply. In the span of just 10 years, the buffalo went nearly extinct and indigenous nations were forcibly relocated to new lands and subjected to eating rations of highly processed foods like flour, sugar, and coffee, which have had lasting negative health implications on reservations. Oops. When I speak of control, I also don't mean just physical control. It is also mental by controlling the narratives through which our society is built. And what is more core to the mythos of America than Thanksgiving? Every year, we actively lie to our children about some idyllic Thanksgiving between the pilgrims and the indigenous nations that never happened. This is no accident. Post-Civil War, our government desperately needed a political tool to regain control of a divided America. Thanksgiving became the perfect solution to not only project an image of unity, but quietly reinforce who exactly America was for. So on the left here, you can see this idealized version of Thanksgiving. On the right, you can see a slightly more accurate depiction of the Trail of Tears, which is actually how we feel and have treated indigenous nations here in our country. Three. Food structures our approach to social and economic problems. If I asked everyone here, what is hunger? We would probably have 50 plus answers. Everyone has their own experience with hunger. So who can classify as others as hungry? And what is the right solution to alleviate that hunger? Eliminating hunger is massively complicated. So the US government has opted for something much more straightforward which is filling a calorie deficit. The concept of calories were coined by chemist Wilbur Atwater in the 1890s and subsequently turned a wide variety of foods into interchangeable widgets that do, technically speaking, stop hunger. 
So pictured here on the left is a popular international hunger relief tool called the CSB, or the corn soy blend, which is, as you can guess, made from corn and soy, and it tastes like ashy cardboard. So fixating on calories allows our government to cognitively distance itself from addressing the larger systems that enable hunger, like poverty. Along with rejecting culturally relevant foods as being less efficient for hunger relief, these are shiny examples of how deeply ingrained paternalism in the U.S. is when we respond to social problems. Capitalism also plays an important part. The U.S. also just happens to have a massive agricultural surplus of corn and soy, turning hungry people abroad into a new market opportunity. Domestically, programs like the Commodity Supplemental Food Program also allows huge agribusinesses to donate mass-produced foods made from crops that they have subsidized with our tax dollars to low-income mothers, children, and the elderly in exchange for a massive tax write-off. And you can see some of these foods on the right here. The abdication of responsibility by our government to ensure an accessible and nourishing food supply for its citizens has long been a fixture in American politics. As President Nixon famously said, instead of government jobs, government housing, and government welfare, let the government use its tax and credit policies to enlist in this battle of hunger, the greatest engine of progress ever developed in the history of man, American private enterprise. I hope from, from these examples, it's clear how much food informs some of the most basic structures in our society. It organizes our social hierarchies, the development and enforcement of our laws, and the design of our economic systems. Food shapes our identities by telling us what version of ourselves is right and what perspective we are meant to use when looking within and at each other. The hidden message behind our food mirror the hidden curriculum we often talk about in our schools. As educators, we have an opportunity to teach our students the very real power of food. Every time we think about food, read about food, talk about food, consume food, and share food with one another. It is our responsibility to acknowledge, embrace, and grapple with the influence food has had and will continue to have on how students engage with the world for the rest of their lives. So I will end with this quote from the legendary representative John Lewis, which I hope sums up the key points from this presentation. Food is not just fuel, it's information. It talks to your DNA and tells it what to do. Food can be a weapon of mass destruction or a tool to create peace. Thank you. <laughs>